Amen. Amen. If you will turn to Luke chapter 12 tonight. Luke chapter 12. <clears throat> Luke 12. So we are looking at uh, another parable of our Lord. We're very excited uh, to be here in this parable. And, <clears throat> and I'm going to tell you, as we read this, God spoke to our heart and really dealt with us. You may, you may hear this again on a Sunday morning in the near future. And if that's the case, then I'll need you to just nod your head and smile and say amen like you never heard it before. Uh, and so, uh, but God's dealt with our heart on this. And it's a message I feel like is needed in this day and age in which we live. And it's a present reminder too for all of us. Uh, but we're going to look tonight at uh, Luke 12, beginning over in verse 13. And I want you to think on this thought, uh, a fool in a fix. A fool in a fix. A fool in a fix. Matthew, or I'm sorry, Luke 12, verse 13. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man... Uh, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, Now, I want you to notice the use of pronouns. I'll mention this again. This is one of the points but I want you just to notice and underline all of the, the pronouns that are used. You're going to find about 12 of them. And he thought within himself saying, What shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. And at least you can put Matthew 16 uh, up there if you don't mind. And then the Lord said this, and this is in red writing. Uh, Jesus said it for, uh, What is a man profit if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So the Lord says, What's it going to profit a man if you, uh, if you win the world, if you gain the whole world, but you lose your soul? So let's look at this parable uh, as it is uh, written here in the text. Now, I want you to notice something very, very significant uh, about this text and what is significant about it. It is the only place in the Word of God, the only place in the Word of God, of all the, the characters that we find in the Bible, of all the misfits that we find in the Bible, of all the evil and wicked people we find in the Bible, this is the only place where God himself calls a man a fool. So this is a pretty serious parable to look at, and let's try to figure out why. Uh, so number one, I just want to show you three things. The parable is very uh, self-explanatory. Uh, remember, a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And literally, parable means to cast alongside. So Jesus has a truth he wants to convey to us. And so he has this heavenly truth, this biblical truth, and he, so he casts alongside it an earthly story, and it helps us to, to, real, to understand the teaching. So this parable says there's a man, he had a field, that field, he had a bumper crop one year. In fact, he had such a bumper crop, he says, you know what? Uh, what am I going to do with all this? I'll tell you what I'm going to do with all this. I've done so good for myself. I'm going to tear down my barns, and I'm going to build bigger barns and greater barns, and I'm going to build more barns, and I'm going to fill those barns full with all the goods of my increase. And, and, then, and, then, and then the parable says, and then that man looked around. He said, boy, he said, I've done well. My barns are full. I am secure for years and years to come. So I think I'm just going to sit back and eat and drink, and I'm going to be merry. And, uh, and that's where the Lord says, Oh, you fool. 
You fool, don't you know that tonight your soul will be required of you? And, uh, and the Lord speaks of being rich in Him. So this is the only place in God's Word where God Himself calls a man a fool. So let's see why does He call this man a fool. Well, number one, he thought that he could satisfy his eternal soul with materialistic things or goods. Uh, he thought he could satisfy his soul with, mater- with materialism. Let's just go right there. And, this, and see, this is what Jesus is talking about. He's, he's talking about uh, being covetous. Uh, and so this is the subject of all of this. And so this man had that attitude. Now listen, I, I can stand here and preach this. Uh, and I can state this all day long. Uh, and, uh, and we can teach this all day long. And I can tell myself this and, and teach myself this. Uh, but still, we don't live our lives like we really believe it. Uh, but number one, this man, uh, he, uh, uh, he tried to satisfy the longings of his eternal soul uh, in a, with material goods. And, and so he placed his trust, he placed his happiness. He placed his prosperity. He 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 uh, uh, he uh, he judged his success by all of the things that he owned, because he owned a bunch of land, uh, because he had a big, because he's able to be a build build a bigger barn, because he had a bumper crop and and life was good. Uh, and so he was trying to find happiness and trying to find contentment in all of the things that he owned. Uh, but sadly, one of the greatest things is he placed his trust in all of those material things. You know, this is an old saying, and we, we say it, we repeat it, but if we really believed it, we would probably live a little different than we live. But we say, you know, you can't take it with you when you die. You can't take it with you when you die. Well, we say that all day long, but if we really believe that, I think our living will be a whole lot different. It was told a preacher went and visited a man who was a miserly, uh, uh, old greedy man. He was greedy. Uh, he was tight with his money, and he, was, uh, he had wealth untold, but he was miserable. And said the preacher went to see him because he wanted to talk to this man. And this man was obviously bitter, though he owned everything he could possibly own. He was trying to find happiness and peace and eternal joy through the things that he owned. And said, the preacher asked him, said, I want you to look outside that window and tell me what you see. And so that man looked outside that glass and he said, well, I see children playing. I see mothers laughing and women laughing. And I see men heading to work preparing for the day. And the preacher picked up a mirror and he said, Now look in this glass and tell me what you see. And he said he got a big frown and a soured look on his face and he said, I just see myself. And the preacher said, Do you know what the difference is between what you looked out that glass and saw versus the glass that you looked into and saw yourself? And that old man said, No what? And he said, A layer of silver. That's what makes a mirror a mirror. You know this, that layer of silver. And so he looked out the window and looked at others, uh, and he saw all that happiness and joy and life taking place. But he, when he looked in that mirror, he saw himself for who he was, and he had trusted in riches all of his life. And at the end of days, he really had nothing. And I thought, what a shame, and what a, as God called this man a fool, what a fool that it would be to think that because I have all of this abundance and all that, that I own and I've done so good for myself and I've been so successful for myself, what a shame it would be to lay on uh, your deathbed, to be given a chance to lay on a deathbed because not everybody's given a chance. Some people die instantly or fall over dead. 
But what a miserable place it would be to lay on your deathbed and know that your 401k is exploding with a million dollars. To know that you possess and you own more than anybody around you in your family or in your neighborhood or in your community. To know that you have been very, very successful materialistically in your lifetime. But to lay there on your deathbed and know all of that, but then to know I've lived a life utterly deprived of Jesus in my life. My goodness. And so God says, that man's a fool because he's trusted in riches. And boy, listen, if I have a heart cry, if I have a heart cry tonight from this parable and maybe in weeks to come from this pulpit on a Sunday morning, I want you to know it is that you can't buy your way into heaven. Uh, you, riches will not get you there. And, it, and, it's, more, and, it's, and it's greater than just eternal uh, it's, it's greater than, uh, uh, it's, it's even, there's even more to it than just the eternal welfare of our soul. But to trust in riches to find happiness, peace, and joy. Listen to me, those things are failing. Those things, rust will corrode. Moth will eat up, Jesus said. All of the things around you that you can put your hands on that you're trying to find happiness and joy in, you're only going to find out at the end of the day that it doesn't really bring joy. I remember we bought Sarah's grandmother's house, the dream of every couple. We bought Sarah's grandmother's house, and uh, we were allowed to remodel. You know, we remodeled it, stripped that, stripped it all the way down to the studs, built it back up from the floor up. And I remember all the excitement leading up to that. I remember all the long days, the hard work, sweat, labor, blood, tears, all that. that we poured into that to, to, to build a house the way we wanted to, to build a house. Uh, it was more than just a, a home for me or a house for me, but it was a place to raise my girls. So I had a lot of meeting. But I'll never forget after we got all that done and we're moved in and we're living there, I'll never forget walking around one day looking at everything and I said, so this is it? This is what everybody gets excited for? This is really it? So listen to me, and, I, and, and I'm not complaining. I, I mean, we're very blessed uh, to, to have the house we have. So I'm not complaining at all. But the fact of the matter is, if I'm trying to get joy uh, out of what I own or what I have, and that's the only source of joy I have, and my friend, listen, I'm going to wake up depressed one day. And if you're trying to gather things and you're trying to gather possessions, and listen, and have you ever noticed that things and possessions, they never satisfy you? Listen, write this down. The flesh is never satisfied. It's never satisfied. It always wants more. If you get a little John boat, you're going to want a bigger boat. And then you want to trade that little boat for a, a little bit bigger boat and then that boat for a little bit bigger boat. The flesh is never satisfied. It's the same thing with new vehicles. You trade in your old vehicle for a new vehicle and, and you'll be riding down the road one day and you're like, what was all the hype about? It's just four tires and a shell that gets me from point A to point B. Uh, and, and so the flesh is never satisfied. And I wish that we could communicate to young people, to young couples, to stop chasing everything you dream of. Stop chasing things. And what about your investment in eternity? What about the fact, have you ever been saved by God's grace? Do you know there's a time and a place where God convicted you of your sin and you bowed your heart and you said, Lord Jesus, save my soul. Do you know that your name's written in the Lamb's book of life? Uh, and then, what have you done with that life He's given you? Have you invested daily in eternity? Have you invested in the things of God? Have you given yourself? Because i tell you what we did with our house. That was a pretty big... It was 1967. I, I think it was 1967. Why did I say that? It was 1957. Anyway, 1957 ranch-style house. And very solid. Had real two-by-fours in the walls. And not those cut-down... Uh, versions, uh, the real deal. We built it the way we wanted, but we said, you know what? This is not our house. This is not, it doesn't belong to us. And we stressed to the girls because I wanted them to get a biblical worldview. I, I didn't want to say, girls, look at our house. Look at my house. Look at what we did. This is yours. This is mine. No. I want to be very clear this belongs to the Lord. 
And, and so we used that and opened it up uh, to other people to bring them in and to minister. And that was our deal with the Lord. Lord, you give it to us, and so we're going to open it up to bring people in. And we're going to minister to others uh, here inside these four walls. Because it's not yours. Just like this church building, we hear compliments all the time about the beauty of it and the care of it. But listen, at the end of the day and the beginning of the day, both, it's not ours. It does not belong to Liberty Baptist Church. If we show up, God forbid, but if we showed up to the sound of uh, fire, uh, sirens and things like that, and, and I walk out in my yard and this church is just in an ash heap because it's burnt to the ground, listen, it still belongs to God. All that you have and all that you are, it belongs to God. And why, heaven help us, why have we as the church fallen in uh, to... <clears throat> to the philosophies of the world that we got to have more and we got to have this and we got to have that and we got to run and have... Uh, listen, this frustrates me that moms and dads will pour so much into their kids so that their kids can keep up with the Joneses' kids and the Smith kids. They'll pour far more into their children so their children can keep up in a certain socioeconomic circle or so that their children can keep up with the modern fads. They'll pour, they'll pour their moms and dads will pour their life into their children for that one sake. But I want to ask you, what about pouring the Bible into your children? What about pouring the Word of God into your children? What about pouring Jesus into the life of your children? What about let your children see you, not necessarily wearing the most stylish, up-to-date clothes and all that, but let your children see you serving the Lord? That's how we get servants in the church, is that we show our children how to serve the Lord. Because listen to me. I'm going places I really didn't think I was going to go tonight, but listen to me. Children almost certainly won't do what you tell them to do, but they'll do what they see you do in front of them. They'll do what they see you model. I think I told you this a long time ago. One time Abigail come to me, and this was, she's probably watching tonight, so she'll call me and, you know, I'll get in trouble for talking about her. Uh, but, this was back during her CIA assassin days. And she was pretty good, I'm telling you. She practiced on birds that would get in our blueberries as our blueberry bushes would try to start ripening and the birds would get in. I'm telling you, I've seen her come through the house bare in sock feet, slide all the way through the dining room, kick open the back door, and with her BB pistol or airsoft pistol, she would commit murder on birds. So she was getting very good at one point in time. So she says, Dad, you talked about building a bow all your life. All my life, she said, that when you was a kid, you'd build, build, a, build a homemade bow and arrows. She said, can you build me one? I said, yeah. I said, oh, yeah, I can do this. I got a challenge now. So when I was a kid, it seemed like in 15 minutes, I could build a bow. And that joker, that string on that thing sounded like a banjo string. It was strung so tight, and I could take homemade arrows, and I could shoot that rascal. 15 minutes, I could have you a bow worthy of any ninja to carry. And I got out that day, and I cut... I cut whatever I cut, and I tried to make a bow, and it didn't work. And I went and cut something else, tried to make a bow, and it didn't work. I went and cut something else, and, and boy, I had carefully, I had been so careful this go around. And I was trying to string that joker, and when I got to stringing that thing, it broke too. That just, I was frustrated, I was sweating, I was having a low blood sugar, I was trying to cook something in the kitchen while trying to do a 15-minute bow. This is 50 minutes later. And I just took that bow and I just slung it through the blueberry bushes. Man, that just smoked me and got the best of me. And so finally I went and cut another one and I made just a little halfway deal. And it wasn't a, it, I mean, it was like Cupid's little bow, you know, something like that. And so I was like, here. And so she gets it and I had some airs there I'd give her to go play with. And I'm in there washing some dishes at the sink, but I'm watching her out there. And, and I watch her. And she can't get it exactly right shooting those arrows. That's all new to her. And she has trouble, and, and a couple of them, they just kind of flop right off the end of this little bow and, and whatnot. Well, the next thing I know, she goes over and picks one of those arrows up, and she slings it. And I thought, she ain't going to act like that. I dried my hands off, laid my little dish towel down, went around to the door, and I said, Abigail, what are you doing? I'm shooting this bow. I said, what did you sling that for? 
She said, because I was mad at it. I said, we don't act like that around here. She said, you did. I said, do as I say, not as I do. (laughs) That's what I said. But listen to me. Kids need to see us living out the gospel, living out Jesus. And and if you're able to to keep your kids in in, in the most stylish fashion, if you're able to take them to the most hip stores, and if you're able to provide them and lavish them with whatever that keeps them uh, right in that little circle that that they want to be in, that's, that's good and wonderful. But listen, I wouldn't give my life investing that in them until first I had spent my life investing the Word of God in them. Because I want to tell you something, one day all of that's going to fail. One day all of that's going to corrode and none of the things that we've, that, that we've given people or that we have ourselves, it's not going to matter. Because I promise you this, if God grants you the privilege of having a deathbed, and that is a privilege, if God grants you a privilege of having a deathbed, I can promise you on your deathbed, because I've been there beside probably hundreds of people dying, you will not be calling for your checking account to be brought to you so you can look at it. You will not be calling for your bass boat, your favorite hunting rifle, You will not be calling for uh, the pictures of your big buck or your big bass. Uh, You won't be calling for your golf clubs. You won't be calling for your 401k account to be brought to you so you can just look at it and cherish it. You, You won't be calling for your bowling trophies or whatever it may be. You won't be calling for any of that. Because at the end of days on your deathbed, all that's going to matter is, is what am I going to do with Jesus and what have I done with Jesus in my lifetime? That's all you'll have or won't have on your deathbed. Now that's a real thing. We're all going to die one day. You know that. And let me remind you, and I don't know why I'm saying this. I'm just going to run there. Some of us, unfortunately, we're just going to fall over dead one day. And they're going to say, did you hear about such and such? Well, they have a picture of perfect health. They found them dead in their kitchen this morning. Just fell over dead. Some of us will be killed in a tragic accident. God forbid. But that happens. Some of us will have long bouts with cancer. Other terminal illnesses. That's going to put us on a, on a deathbed. Some of us will grow old. A friend, oh, an old friend of mine used to tell me all the time, he'd say, he'd say, David, he said, growing old's not fun. He said, be careful what you ask God for. And, 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 and when we come to that place, whether it's in the kitchen, sudden death, tragic accident, cancer, other terminal illnesses, or God lets us grow old and we, and we lay on a deathbed in old age just waiting for God to come get us. All that's going to matter is, is have I spent my lifetime preparing my eternal soul? Have I given my life to Jesus and then have I lived Jesus out? Because friends, listen to me, it's time. It is time we start living for Jesus. It's time we start living our life out and we take all that he's given us and all that he's blessed us with and we serve him with it. You know what usually happens is we're never satisfied to come to a place where we just live comfortably. You know, God blesses us. We, he gives us the ability to work hard. He opens up job opportunities, and we work hard, and He blesses us, and we're able to have some things, uh, and, and we're able to build maybe some wealth. Uh, but we never come to a place where we li- can live comfortably. Just the other day, I heard about somebody who, who become wealthy, and now they're becoming wealthier, and they're becoming wealthier, and becoming wealthier. And, 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 and I've noticed that the more wealthy they become, just the more things they buy. Because they say, I'm making more money now so I can buy more. So they're buying more land, they're buying more houses, they're buying more things. And they're doing all of, these, all of this. So at what point do we ever become comfortable and satisfied? We never do because the flesh is never satisfied. And so there's got to be a place in our life where we realize that and we see that. And, 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 and I'm not just a mockingbird standing up here just spouting out some kind of uh, something about being covetous. But, I, but I'm speaking what's in the Bible. It's biblical truth. Uh, and, and so what are you doing with what God has blessed you with? 
God called this man a fool because he thought he could find happiness, contentment, and eternal satisfaction in the things that he owned. Traveling around northeast Georgia, I see uh, homeless people a lot, especially in my hometown in North Carolina, plagued with homelessness for various reasons. But And, and listen, the, the most wealthy of you listening, the most wealthy of you here tonight, at the end of days, you are no different than those homeless beggars that we see on the streets. Because at the end of days, all that's going to matter is, is have you ever been saved and born again? And if you have been, then what have you done with your life? What have you done with your life? So that's number one. Let me just close quickly then. So number two, why did God call him a fool? Watch this, and I've already preached this actually. It's because he smugly assumed that he was going to live to a ripe old age. Because you hear what he said in the parable. He said, I've got enough goods to last me for years. I think I'm just going to eat, drink, and be merry. He assumed that he was going to have long life. But his assumption was wrong. And God said, tonight, you fool, I'm going to require your soul of you. And so none of us, none of us know when we're going to go. For me, it may be before the clock strikes midnight tonight. For you, it may be 9 o'clock tonight or 6 a.m. in the morning. None of us know. I've lost lost in my lifetime many good, good, close, close friends. Many. And uh, many of them in terrible accidents, tragedies, terrible tragedies. And, And a couple of them affected me very, very deeply. Very, very deeply, the kind of uh, the kind of hurt that you really don't tell anybody about because it just hurts so bad, and it affects you so bad. But one of my friends, he was killed when he was forty, and another one was killed when he was thirty-three. And the thing that stirred in my heart for years after that, and particularly close to the time that it happened, was. And I don't know why it come to me like this. It's the way God gave it to me. But, but both my friends, they got up that morning. Their clock went off and they got out of bed just like I do every day. And they did their morning routine, whatever that was. Both of them were athletes and they, they may have exercised or ran, drank their coffee. But then I thought, you know what? And then they, they sat down on, on the end of the bed or on the chair in their bedroom and they they pulled socks up on their feet. They put shoes up on their feet, and they tied those shoes. And they left that house that day fully believing that they would be home at the end of the day to unwind and do whatever their normal activities were. They left home that morning fully planning on a vacation in three months that they'd already booked, reserved, and paid for looking forward to the beach trip or the lake trip or the camping trip. They left home that morning anticipating going to their children's birthday party in two weeks or throwing their child a birthday party in two weeks. They left home that morning with all the plans that you and I have every single day, but they did not know. And God called that man a fool because he assumed that he was going to have long life. And so don't let us be fools and assume that there's going to be a retirement for us one day. Don't let us be a fool to assume that if I have more, if I could just buy this, and if I could just buy that, and if I could just grow here and grow there and accumulate more and accumulate wealth, don't let us assume that we're ever going to get to enjoy the fruits of that. And don't let us sell our life believing that those things can bring us happiness and lasting joy. And they certainly cannot bring us eternal life. So that's number two. He wrongly assumed that he was going to live to a ripe old age. And then number three, he was called a fool because he was totally self-centered. He was totally self-centered. 
those 12 pronouns that we find. He's all about me, myself, and I. Look what I've done. Look at my crop. I'm going to tear down my barn, build bigger barns for me. And I've got plenty. I've done this and I've done that. So I am content for years to come. I think I will just eat, drink, and be merry. It's all about himself. And we see this self-centeredness not only in the world around us like crazy. Everybody is out for themselves. And they're willing to fight and get mad about it. It's all about themselves. But that self-centeredness has crept into the church. That's why the church, your average church, is inward focused rather than outward focused because it's all about me, myself, and I. And I know I sound like a broken record on that because I think just the other Sunday we talked about this. But that's, that's where your average believer is, is. It's all about me, myself, and I. I can give you illustrations of this all day long. So you know what? A church will get together and have a coat drive. You know what we do and we ask people to do? Go clean out your closets and bring any used coats that you don't wear anymore. Bring them to the coat drive because we're going to give them to the needy in the community. What if we quit thinking about me, myself, and I, and we said this, we're going to have a coat drive. March your little tail right up there to town to the store and buy a brand new coat and bring it right back down here. And we're going to give people that need it a new coat, not a used coat that you've cleaned and washed up. Huh? You with me? I ain't swallowed no rabbit up here, no frog or toad. I mean, I think I'm speaking truth. And, 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 and it's, and, and, you know, build something new in a church and you know what people do? They'll be like, well, well, preacher, we know you build a new fellowship hall, so I've got this old used microwave. I just got a new microwave, but I got an old used microwave. I'm going to bring it up here because we need it. Uh, I, and, and the church winds up, and, and you know what God said in Malachi? God said, you keep bringing me secondhand junk, and I'll close the doors of the church. That's what God said, not me. So if you're going to get mad tonight, get mad at God. That's what he said. He said, you're, you wouldn't offer secondhand junk to the governor. You wouldn't offer secondhand stuff to the president. You're going to give them the best. So why am I the only one that you're going to give second-hand effort to or second-hand stuff to? You bring me the best. And God says, if you don't, I'll close the doors of the church. And friend, you listen to me. It's one thing for me to lock the doors of that church because you can come in. I can hang a chain around it and you can still come in. But when God shuts the doors, they nobody be able to open it because he said, I'll close doors that you can never open. And I'll open doors that you can never close. And, and so this man was called a fool for those three reasons. I know we went just a little bit into overtime tonight, but listen to me. That's a text right there that you need to go home and you need to read it again. And tomorrow morning you need to read it again until God settles that in your soul. And then ask God, God, give me an outward look with my life and all of my possessions. Teach us to be content and not to covet because, listen, the, thou should not covet. That's the last of the Ten Commandments. But watch this. If you break that one commandment, that last commandment, it will lead you to break all nine others. The Bible's full of that. Eve coveted the forbidden fruit. Mankind fell because of that. Uh, we see Achan, he coveted the, some possessions of the enemy. He wanted that. It cost him and his family, and it, and it cost the army. And we can go all throughout the Bible where we see David coveted uh, uh, Bathsheba. Uh, and, and so we go all throughout the Bible where men have coveted. And Jesus, he stresses, what does it gain a man if he wins the whole world and has the whole world, but he loses his soul? And so that's the heart of the matter. So pray, God, how can I use what you've given me to serve you? Everything you've given me, how can I use it? to serve you and to show my children this is what a servant of Christ looks like. This is it. And so may God add the blessings to that text and the reading of his word. And we've looked tonight at a fool in a fix.